So how do we actually grow fruit in our life? That's the question, right? We've been walking through this, and we've been talking about fruit, but where does that fruit come from? It's not done from our own efforts, right? In verse 24, it says, And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So that means that our bodies, the works that we do, are dead, right? If something's crucified, it's gone. So the only thing that is going to grow that fruit is the Spirit, is Jesus. And where can we found that? Where can we find that? By studying the Bible, by living our lives in prayer. And so that's how we grow fruit in our lives. This week I was reading about an author who had a tree in the middle of his ranch in California, and he noticed that fruit on this tree was produced year-round. It didn't matter the season. It didn't matter the time. That's because the roots went deep and got its nutrients from below. Even if the weather came and it weathered the tree and battered the tree, the tree was still producing the same fruit. It may have been a little bit more difficult, but the fruit was still there. The tree didn't stop producing even though the elements were around it because the tree was not yielding to the elements. Um, So the first thing I wanted to talk about on how this tree was doing that, well, the roots soaked up the nutrients from far below. I just made that point. The roots soaked up the nutrients from far below the surface. This is why we so desperately need a healthy relationship with God. If we are going to be like this tree, if we are going to produce fruit like a tree does, then we have to get our nutrients from somewhere other than above. And where are we going to get that from? By founding ourselves on God's Word. God's Word has everything we need to help us grow in Christ. Secondly, the leaves of this tree bask in the sunlight each day. Callie and I have two beautiful Japanese magnolia trees in our front yard. And I wish I should have, I should have taken a picture, but I didn't. But these trees have tons of branches, and all the branches grow upward like this. And if you get actually on the inside, because the outside is covered in foliage, but if you get to the inside, you can see that these large branches have these tiny little branches growing off. And they don't have leaves on them unless they're able to weave their way through the other branches and get to the sunlight. And in the same way, We can't be content with darkness. We have to grow towards the light. In 1 Peter 2, verse 9, Peter tells us, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We can't stay in darkness if we're going to proclaim Jesus, if we're going to have the fruit of Jesus in our life. And thirdly, this tree, obviously, but I'm going to say it, the branches never separated from the life-giving trunk of the tree, right? So a few weeks ago, my wife and I were out in the yard, and we were killing some weeds because, man, those weeds grow so quick, you can't keep up with them, right? How many of you (laughs) have struggled with that? But I was starting to prune one of these trees because there are so many branches that some of those little ones really will never make it. So I was pruning off those branches, and some of them had a few leaves on. I can guarantee you as soon as I cut those off, they were dead. And I can tell you for sure that a day later, the leaves that were green are now brown. This is perhaps the clearest truth also for us as Christians because in Scripture, it specifically addresses this fact. In John, the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 4 and 5, most of you may know this verse, these verses, but here it is. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. We have to yield to the Lord in order to produce fruit. So these three evidences show that. And this truth is especially true for the fruits of kindness and goodness, which I think are something that all of us struggle with. And it's one of those things that you don't think about, but kindness and goodness is really difficult to show. So, if we don't soak up the truth of God's Word, if we don't live in His light, and if we don't stay connected to Jesus, we will not grow in kindness and goodness. We're going to grow in meanness and wickedness. 
I think we would all agree that our society is growing meaner and meaner, right? It, it, you see it everywhere. You see it on the news. Quinn and I were just talking about that this morning. You see it on the news every morning. You see it in grade school. Kids are getting bullied early and earlier and earlier. But I can tell you this, that it's not something that's new. <laughs> My kids, who are one and three, can be very mean to one another. In fact, on Friday, we had some friends over who had a uh, one-year-old girl that was my son's age, and we were playing with some blocks, and my son and I were building a little tower, and she came over and wanted to help, so she picked up a block. And what did my son do? He reached for that block and took it out of her hand and proceeded to hit her on the head. <laughs> of course, I immediately scooped, her up, scooped him up and said, Oliver, we don't do that, to which he responded, eh! Of course, kids, you know, they don't really understand what you're saying, but it's the process, it's the discipline of we don't, we don't act out of meanness. But he's not doing that because he wants to do it. He's doing that because it's a natural sin nature that's within him. Meanness is not something that we have to learn. We're born with a sin nature. And so that's why I've said this before, but the desires of the flesh don't look anything like the fruit of the Spirit. Because our flesh naturally wants to do something that's the polar opposite of Jesus Christ. Because we're born into sin and we need a savior. Um, but meanness is also not just found in children. It's found in retail. In fact, this week I uh, saw on the news that there was a local McDonald's actually right here in Memphis that a man was very upset about his $2 chicken sandwich. And went in and was arguing with the people at the counter and telling him that he didn't get his order right on a $2 chicken sandwich, emphasizing the $2, right? And so he decides that he's going to start threatening the employees and grabs the cash register and starts throwing it and does $10,000 worth of damage just over a chicken sandwich. This is the meanness that I'm talking about. We see meanness in language all the time. Everybody in here probably has social media. If you don't, count yourself blessed because meanness is all over there too. People use words in such hateful ways. Even Jimmy Kimmel has a segment on his show called Mean Tweets where he literally brings celebrities onto his show and sits down with them and they look at the mean tweets that people say about them and laugh about it. In fact, it's become a game show that people are literally saying the meanest things they can in hopes to get onto Jimmy Kimmel's show. So anyway, the point is mean things, meanness is something that's naturally inherent in us when we're born. So. We're talking about, as Christians, we should be trees that have life-giving fruit from Jesus. How are we going to show kindness? We should be yielding to the Lord, and we should see the opposite of meanness produced in us. We should see the fruit of kindness. The fruit of kindness. In Colossians chapter 6, verse 12, Paul says, Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, Kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Notice how that starts. It says, put on then. Put on. Well, that to me sounds like Paul's talking about clothing. We should clothe ourselves in kindness. When you get up in the morning or when you're about to go out with some friends or you're going to take your wife on a date or your husband if the wife decides to plan it, when you plan for those things and you get dressed in the morning, you literally put on your clothes. You decide what you're going to put on. You decide if you're going to put on dress shoes or tennis shoes or whether you're going to wear slacks or jeans or you're going to wear a button-down or a t-shirt, right? All of these things are decisions we make before we walk out the door. What Paul is saying is not only should you decide things like that, but you should decide every day to put on kindness. But what is kindness? Kindness. Kindness is the kindness of Christ. Take a look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God and Christ forgave you. It's a kindness that has genuine concern and compassion for people. It's a kindness that forgives as Christ has forgiven you. Kindness is not something that we can do on our own, but if we're deeply rooted in the word of God and in the love of Christ, and we're reminded of his great sacrifice for us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, that's kindness. 
That's the ultimate picture of kindness. And if we can start our day in that kindness and remember to walk out of our houses clothed in that kindness, that's how we're going to walk forward in life with kindness and not meanness. We're focusing our hearts and our minds on something greater than this world and what we want. We're clothing ourselves in the kindness of Christ. And let me remind you that kindness is not weakness or empty sentiments. In fact, it takes great discipline, as I've just described, to keep kindness in your life, to make that a discipline that you walk through. You have to be determined to be kind. It's not easy. Meanness is easy. But we see it everywhere. Meanness. What about kindness? What does kindness look like? Kindness is caring about the needs of others and working to meet those needs. Kindness is praying for someone who has set themselves up to be your enemy. Kindness is forgiving anyone who has wronged you. Kindness is sharing biblical truth with someone searching for answers. Kindness is benevolence. I know I just ran through all of those really quickly, but if you can get this last point that kindness is benevolence, it sums it all up. It's this idea that you desire more than anything in your heart to do kind things for others, to love others when they're not loved, to pray for others when they need prayer, to lift others up when they're in joy, and to be with others when they're in times of need and struggle. We will grow in kindness when we yield ourselves to the Lord. Benevolence, like I just said, is something that a lot of churches talk about too. You probably even have, a, have been to a church before where they say, this is our benevolence ministry, right? But what is benevolence? A lot of people don't practice benevolence because they're not yielding to the Lord. Yes, it's great for a church to have a benevolence ministry, but why can't we, as the people of God, be benevolent people and do that same work in our own lives? When you see somebody in need, reach out a hand and help them. When someone contacts you with something they're struggling with, pray for them right there. Don't say, I'll, I'll pray for you and don't do it. Why not when you tell someone, hey, I'm going to pray for you for that. Can I pray for you right now? And bow your head and pray for them right there. Benevolence is the little things. It's not the big things. It's the little things. We must pursue God with all of our heart. Only then will our roots be firmly planted in Him and then we'll be able to bear the fruit of the Spirit. So, if we do not yield ourselves to the Lord, not only will we see the opposite of kindness, which is meanness, but we will also see the opposite of goodness, which is wickedness. Abuse has not been something that has been highlighted greatly in the news over the past few years, but let me tell you this, that it is very prevalent in the lives of everyday people. In fact, my own life as a child, I grew up in a home where abuse was something that happened. And I don't say that as something to get you to pity me. I'm just saying it is a true fact that a lot of people go through abuse and you don't even know it. And abuse doesn't always have to look like something that's physical, but it does exist. A few years ago, a study was done of over 1,000 people of different ages and races. And it revealed that about one in every three people has experienced physical abuse at some point in their life. In the same study, 37.7% of women claimed that they had been sexually abused at some point in their lifetime. Abuse of any kind is wicked and should be treated as such. For the past 50 years, our nation has allowed legalized abortion I'm not in here to stand up here and talk about a political point here. I'm just talking about the pure fact of how Jesus describes life and when life begins. The overwhelming amount of cases of abortion in our country over the past 50 years have actually nothing to do with health of the mother or a case of rape or incest. The Guttmacher Institute, which is a very reputable institute, conducted a survey that indicated Less than 0.5% of women who have had abortions had abortions related to incest. 1% of women that had abortions had abortions related to rape. So, what happens in the rest? That same study indicated that 74% of women who have abortions went through with them because they claimed the child would dramatically change their life. 
whether by interfering with their career, their education, or simply, I already have kids and I don't need another one. And I'm not blaming women in this case either. It's not just women to blame. It's men too, because men sometimes put that pressure on the woman to say those things. You need to be getting a job. You need to keep working. We can't sacrifice your career. We can't lose that money. We already have enough mouths to feed. It comes from both directions. But I want to say this, that at the end of the day, the reason why abortion is so sad is because it's about unwanted children. It's about a life that is not wanted. And this, I can't imagine going through. Because it is a violent act, abortion. It's murdering that life. And so this is the exact thing that people are fighting to uphold, and this is the exact thing as Christians we should oppose because it is wickedness. As Christians who are like trees yielding to the Lord, we should see the opposite of wickedness produced in our life. Not wickedness, but the fruit of goodness. The fruit of goodness. Now, in the Bible, there is a dilemma that we see because Paul, in another letter that he wrote to the Romans, writes this about goodness. In Romans chapter 3, verse 12, he says, All have turned aside, together they have become worthless, and no one does good, not even one. You say, well, that makes no sense, because if I have the fruit of the Spirit, how can I be good if Paul is saying no one does good? Well, remember, if we go back to Galatians chapter 5, Verse 24, it says, And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we've crucified the flesh, then we really haven't, can't do good. There's no way we can do good because the flesh is us without Jesus. So if we've crucified that flesh, we can't do good, but we can do good through the work and the Spirit of Christ that lives within us. So, the first point, none of us can be good or do good in and of ourselves. Sometimes you hear people even talking about realizing the goodness in yourself. I want to tell you right now that is not biblically true. You don't have goodness in you. If you don't believe me, you can come hang out with my children. I already gave you an example. <laughs> you don't have goodness naturally in yourself. You can't recognize that. We have a sin nature inside ourselves. We are messed up people. Goodness happens actually out of an abundance of kindness because kindness and goodness are connected together. If kindness was defined as benevolence, then goodness can be defined by beneficence. Goodness is literally the action of kindness. So we talked about kindness. If kindness is you praying for one another and seeing someone in need, then goodness is taking that kindness and acting upon it. Goodness is going the extra mile. Goodness is a required state that you're like, this person needs this and I'm going to go even further and take them that far. Goodness is the story of the Good Samaritan. After two other people pass by the man that was beaten on the side of the road, the Good Samaritan comes up. And what does he do? He lifts the man off the side of the road. He carries him to the next town. He pays for his medical bills. He makes sure that he's comforted and fed and then says, I will come back to check on him. That is goodness. Goodness is going the extra mile. It's not just, oh, I'm going to do good today and I checked it off my list. It's, I'm going to do good for this person or this situation and then I'm going to follow up later and make sure that good is still happening for this situation. So kindness is benevolence. It's the character traits of doing good. And goodness is beneficence. It's taking that character trait and actually doing it. Kindness and goodness are related. We cannot ever do good, though, if Jesus is not at the base of our roots. If the foundation that we're built on is not this right here, the Bible. If this isn't part of your daily walk, you're not ever going to be able to do good. Because this is where the truth of God comes from. My next point, God's goodness can reign in us and shine through us. And when we begin a relationship with God, the love, grace, and mercy of God doesn't erase sin from our life, but it overshadows it. I want you to hear what I'm saying here. 
Just because you became a Christian doesn't mean that God erases all of your sin and it's gone forever. He still sees that sin, but it's been overshadowed by the wonderful sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Jesus stands in the gap and says, yes, you're a sinner, but I died for you and love you anyway. And God sees us through that sacrifice. So our sin is not erased, but it's overshadowed by the amazing sacrifice of Christ. And now, because of that, we can shine the goodness of Christ into the darkest places on the planet. I want to remind you, like I just said, goodness is not passive, but it must take an active posture. Kindness is the characteristic, remember, but goodness is acting out that kindness. You can't sit idle and exercise the fruit of goodness. You cannot sit idle and have the goodness to champion the values outlined in God's word. You cannot sit idle and have the goodness to champion the values outlined in God's word. Now, we're not saying this to try and force our religion on somebody or because we believe God's plan is the, is the best plan. We are doing this because it's out of our roots. It's out of our foundation. Our foundation is on the word of God. We want people to know the truth, right? Loving someone without sharing the truth really isn't love at all. So, if we're championing the values outlined in Christ, the championing of those values is not something that's forceful, but it's saying, hey, this is the truth, and I love you whether you believe it or not, but I want you to know Jesus loves you, and here's why. Goodness to serve complete strangers without promise of anything in return. You cannot sit idle and have the goodness to serve complete strangers without promise of anything in return. Our church has done nothing but go out and serve complete strangers. And I'm not saying this to sound like, hey, pat us on the back, we're doing a great job. I'm saying this because out of the goodness of God and out of the truth of his word, we're going out and doing exactly what he tells us to do. We've gone and done food drives and served food to hundreds of families. We've helped families impacted by financial difficulties related to COVID-19. We've served schools and sports teams because we care about them. We also minister to people every single week right here in the YMCA where we have a prayer time at 11 o'clock on Tuesdays. Some of you have come where we literally connect with people who aren't necessarily coming to our church. They may not even have a relationship with Jesus, but we're connecting with those people. We're praying with those people out of the goodness that God has given us through his Holy Spirit. But you cannot sit idle and have the goodness to go beyond what is required. Like I said before, goodness, which is beneficence, is going that extra mile, just like the story of the Good Samaritan. The Greek word for goodness in this uh, section of Galatians and this, these verses, I'm going to try to pronounce it here, it's agathosune, is found only four times in the New Testament. And it's only ever used by Paul. And it has this idea, like I said, of going the second mile with someone. It's an extremely important word. It's not just, I'm going to do good, like I said, it's going the extra mile. And finally, you cannot sit idle and exercise the goodness to care for those inside our church family. Why would someone want to be a part of a community where the person right next to them doesn't care about what they're going through? Why would someone want to be a part of a community where they walk in and they're completely ignored? I want you to know here at Transform Church, we care about each and every one of you. We love each and every one of you. We notice when you're not here and we don't check in because we want to pester you. We check in because we care We want to do good by you. And it's not just Josh and I as pastors, but it's every single person in here. We want you to know that we love you, we care about you, and we want to do good by you. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, which is the next chapter in this book we're studying, it says, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. If we can't do good, if we can't exercise kindness, it's because we're not rooted deeply in the Word of God. If we can't put those things on every morning, it's because we're not reminded of the great, great love that Jesus has 
for us. There's a reason why the fruit of the Spirit is love. Because love is the greatest commandment of all, right? Because God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. This is the goodness and the kindness that we have because God had such kindness and such goodness for us that he did those things because he loves us.